This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus episode 707. It's great to be back in the saddle here after our summer vacation. Uh, this week, we welcome Dr. Jovan Pantelic. He's a PhD and a research scientist at the Well Living Lab. We're going to talk about COVID, the Internet of Things, wildfires, and indoor air quality. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. And don't forget, after the show, we've got afterthoughts.iaqradio.com, sponsored by First On Site. IAQ Radio Plus Marquee Sponsor is First On Site Property Restoration at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association Sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at acgih.org. AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at RestorationIndustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA, at EIA-USA.org. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, TSI Inc. at TSI.com, Tramex Meters at TramexMeters.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Ralph Froelich. Helix Environmental Inc. in Dayton, Ohio, who was first to identify John Stenhouse as the inventor of the first protective mask, which removed more harmful gases than previous masks through the use of adsorbent charcoal filtration. The IQ Radio trivia question for today, 8th of September, has been sponsored by (laughs) PSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ radio trivia question. Name the special type of glazing that assists in temperature control by using electricity to change tint, preventing unwanted heat loss or heat gain. Back to you, Joe. All right. Dr. Jovan Pentelich joined the Well Living Lab in September 2020 after transitioning from his position as a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, where he was completing COVID-19 related research. Over the past 17 years, he's worked on various topics related to indoor air quality, spanning from the spread of infectious disease to the impact of large scale episodic pollution events, such as wildfires on indoor air. And for the past seven years, he's worked in the field of the internet of things, sensing and is considered one of the leading experts in the field. Yovan, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you. Um, let, let's start with your background a little bit. I don't, I don't know if everybody realized, but you started, you got your PhD in Singapore, but before that you got um, your undergrad work was in, in Serbia, actually. And um, I'm wondering what kind of regional differences do you notice? I mean, you, you've been in Singapore, you've been in Serbia, you've been in across the United States here. What types of regional differences with respect to concerns about indoor air quality, do you see? Oh, okay, interesting question. So uh, one big thing is, of course, being a a European and educated in Europe, uh, heating and cooling is done usually through uh, through, uh, water-based systems. So ventilation itself and the air systems are not as developed or as widely used mechanical ones as, as they are in the US. So I think that's a big difference. A lot of European buildings, they um, they do 
rely a lot on natural ventilation and they are designed for more natural ventilation um, than in the United States. So I think that would be, when it comes to IAQ, one big difference, um, how we operate. So um, another thing probably would be the expectation of people. That's, uh, that's another uh, big difference, I think, especially in Nordic countries uh, where science of indoor air quality truly started. Sweden, Denmark, uh, Norway, Finland, uh, where they really had very early concerns about that uh, with all the energy efficiencies measures they were applying and, uh, and looking into how to improve lives of people and, and, uh, and improve their air quality. So, so I think that would be kind of to sum it up, I, I think those are kind of my observations. I, I don't have any data to back it up. It's it's more anecdotal what I observed living in the U.S. for a number of years, living in Asia and living in, in, in Europe as well. What about in Serbia? I mean, that's kind of what southeastern Europe, um, a little more... Right. A little different climate from the uh, from the, the Scandinavian countries. Is there much uh, awareness or, or concern about indoor air quality issues in Serbia? Uh, significantly less, I would say, than in the United States. The, I think um, I think primarily concern there would be to save money. Energy is substantially more expensive, so air quality kind of is still a little bit under the radar in. In, I would say where I'm from, southeastern Europe, uh, but the situation is getting better. We have uh, in Serbia, I think nowadays more smart buildings, uh, a lot more buildings that are mechanically ventilated. But it's um, it's very seldomly that you would encounter really centralized or mechanical system for ventilation, especially in residential. Which, uh, on the flip side of it, you have a very common use of split systems uh, for for summer. Uh, cooling, which are just recirculating the air. So I, I think U.S. is a little bit more advanced uh, than that. Uh, Western Europe also a little bit more advanced compared to really, really, uh, well, I could say Southeastern Europe. Now, what about Singapore? That's a hot, humid climate. I think they have a lot of mechanically ventilated, at least the bigger buildings. I don't know about the residential here in the U.S., you know, mold was the big topic and, and continues to be a huge topic for in, indoor air quality folks. What about in Singapore? Are they concerned about mold and, or, or are there other indoor air quality issues they're concerned about? Uh, yes. So mold in Singapore, number one concern. No doubt about that. We are talking about a year, year round summer. That is the humid displace, one of the humid displace. It's a tiny island. Uh, in Pacific Ocean with a very warm weather and very warm water around. So there is a lot of moisture in air. I, I know SI system, so we are looking about above 20 to 27 grams per, per kilogram of moisture. So it's it's extremely humid there, 70, 75% every day relative humidity. So mold growth is a massive issue. Um, Singapore standard is a little bit uh, looser because they cannot maintain uh, relative humidity inside the buildings as possible in the U.S. Uh, so they, they have a benchmark of uh, 60% or lower humidity uh, throughout the year. So, uh, but yes, they, they, the, the mold often, you can see it even in the state of the art buildings, it grows. It's very challenging to, uh, to uh, prevent it because uh, mold always starts to grow. You have interface of cold and warm air and you cannot really isolate or, or fully insulate your building from, from penetration of, of humid air from outside. So that would be the places where the mold start to grow first. So in Singapore, that's a serious issue, but they, they have a very good maintenance and, and keeping things, keeping things uh, clean. But you can always enter a building and see mold growing inside some ceiling tiles and they repair and replace it and so on. So a little bit more challenging, but they do take care of it substantially well, very much. All right, let's let's switch over to what you do at Well Living Lab. Can you give our audience a little idea of exactly what a research scientist working at the Well Living Lab does? Um so we do uh, like a we do differently than academia. We well, okay, maybe I should say it like this. Uh, we do a lot of um, interdisciplinary research. 
because we are a team that can be guided to uh, and then to a single goal, and we can easily have five or six different expertise on a single project. So we do a lot of research of interaction between human and environment and how that environment impacts human health. So from, from the side of we have expertise in measuring environmental parameters and also measuring biometrics of human and, and health outcomes. Uh, also, we do have a, a lot of expertise in measuring other aspects of, of well-being that are more kind of soft and uh, related to human psychology. So we really cover the whole suite of, of tools and, and ranges of things that would provide uh, how humans interact with the environment, how inter environment impacts human, their psychological or well-being health, and, and how they impact their, their actual physical health. So that would be that would be kind of a big picture of what we do there. In specific, uh, a lot of us work on uh, different projects. Uh, we have a really big um, IT team. Uh, so we were, I was lucky because I, I was very interested in IoT and implementation of IoT. And only really when I joined Well Living Lab, it really came to full fruition. And uh, we were the first one who really published papers on uh, IoT sensing and, and control of IoT connected devices for air quality. So um, so we did a lot of groundbreaking research in, in that field. And I was really happy that I was able to join, join the lab that already had a tech team ready and uh, very capable, a lot of capabilities that were built over years. So, so for me, I usually would process the data, design studies. Um, a lot of time I spend um, discussing colleagues what are new potential studies, what are the knowledge gaps that we should address and also um, a little bit different than academia, we don't often hear some feedback from what are needs of the industry, so we can actually provide some uh, answers that the industry needs. So that's that's kind of to sum it up how what we generally do there. I noticed um, we were going to have Dr. Pope, I believe it was, on the show, and what was interesting about him, and he also is at the Well Living Lab, or, or was, I guess, I don't know if he's still there, but um, yeah, he's still there. All right. His background was more in um, like physiology. You know, he, he was, you know, exercise and physiology and things like that, if I recall correctly. And I, I remember Richard Corsi years ago now, maybe six or seven, did a keynote for one of the indoor air conferences. And his, his initial th um, big push of his was to try and get more people from psychology and from uh, sociology and, and different people involved in indoor air quality research to look at it in, in, a, in a more holistic manner. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. Yes, that's what we do. And, uh, and uh, yes, we, we, Zach Pope, Dr. Zach Pope is uh, part of the team. We also had some other people with a similar background as Zach, more physiology, uh, but we do have, people on the team with a background in psychology as well. At the moment, we have Dr. Robbie Klein, so, uh, so that we can truly holistically look into, into, uh, into interaction between humans and the environment. We also had um, a, a really great team that was able to process data in many ways. So we have statisticians in our team, data scientists. So we, were, we really have expertise in all areas of uh, of science, I would say, related to air quality or environmental quality a little bit more broader. You know, that's been another big focus of some of our guests is to, to be more, uh, consider more the people in the building as opposed to just the building, you know, and how the people interact with the building and how the building interacts with the people, because basically that's what, you know, why we're doing indoor air quality is for the people. Um, yeah, that's that's very true, and you know it's very easy to lose uh, lose sight of that buildings are actually designed for people. They exist to house people, not to be energy efficient or or to be you know something else. Uh, sometimes they are just marvels of architecture, but uh, but uh, they don't don't function well or produce really a great environment for people to be there and live in or work in. So yes, we often forget that because there are other incentives that are more tangible, you know, to say, okay, I'll improve your environment and improve health. It's very difficult to really understand it tangibly. Like, uh, I think well standards um, uh, 
and uh, IWBI did a good job in, in, in really bridging that gap, providing some more tangible evaluation of that. But, you know, it's kind of still a elusive subject, like, okay, so yes, the air will be better and you will be healthier. But, you know, if I save energy, I see that in my, in my bill immediately. So, so we are still, still kind of working on that, providing that type of relationship, uh, how to improve environment and what are these benefits health benefits that, that they can be really accounted for in a, in a, to that level of accuracy, if possible, as you can really account for energy improvements and reduction of your electricity bills. Yeah, it's hard to compare the money saved by having a healthier indoor environment versus the money saved by cutting back on outdoor air or something like that. Yeah, it's a very complex issue. So, so we kind of all intuitively know that be, to be true, but when it comes to okay, quantifying I mean, that, that's that's much harder. So. All right, let's let's talk a little bit about your work with COVID. Um, I know you you, you did, were doing COVID research back at Berkeley and and um, at at the Berkeley National Laboratory. Tell us a little bit. Just give us your general thoughts. First of all, do you think? We're going to see a big wave of COVID this winter. And what type of things were you working on with respect to COVID research? Okay, so I'll I'll answer the second question first, like so a little bit to my background. So I started on airborne transmission of infection disease. I did a PhD uh, on that topic. So I started working on that in about 2006. So that was a long, long time ago. So. Um, in Singapore, it was just after, after um, actually also um, coronavirus outbreak in Hong Kong, when there was a lot of interest in Asia about potential disease outbreaks. Uh, so I came to Singapore, that was a uh, one topic of interest and, and did a, a lot of analysis design a particular system to, uh, to reduce the, the transmission to reduce the exposure of people. So I got, then I moved and worked with Don Milton specifically on influenza transmission or airborne transmission in influenza where I was primarily uh, doing air sampling uh, and sam I was a virus hunter basically. So I was trying to catch virus that humans in, in, in exhale and really preserve its viability and also, but also catch it in the terms that it can be analyzed and we can see what it is and do the DNA analysis on it. So, so with all that, uh, that background in, in just the general infection disease transmission in specifically in depth on, on influenza, I was uh, towards the end of my work in, uh, in uh, UC Berkeley, uh, I was invited by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to join their project. When COVID started, they got a, a federal grant to look into uh, mitigation options of, uh, of that. So uh, throughout that process with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, I, uh, we, we had very interesting findings uh, that I think uh, were very impactful. Um, and of course, with Don, Don Milton, that was a really in-depth study of a particular disease and, and providing a proof that actually when humans exhale virus, there is a lot of lot of how much virus is exhaled. We were the first study who ever quantified the amount of virus that people exhale. And more importantly, we show that the uh, exhaled virus is actually alive. So that there is a potential for airborne transmission. So which is always being questioned until that moment. We were actually the first study that that for influenza in particular, of course for tuberculosis that was known. So um so that's kind of like in a in a in a very short description of what I did. I can describe a little bit of things that I I found if that's of an interest, but I'll, I'll I'll pause for now to see if I should go a little bit deeper in what's how well, I yeah, sum up my my knowledge. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the findings. You mentioned that there were findings that were yeah. important. Tell us what they are. Yeah, so I'll start with the the last one, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So we did compare how uh, how heating and cooling systems dilute the the potentially exhale viruses. And we saw a tremendous difference. The same system says distribution of, of diffusers, um, but uh, one for heating, one in a heating mode, another one in the cooling mode. And we saw a substantially higher concentration of potentially virus viruses in air in a heating mode because the, the air distribution is not fully mixed. Uh, it, it, it really depends the hot air tend to rise and wants to stay at the ceiling level. 
that's not something new. People knew that, but that's that in winter, actually, during the heating season, we really need to increase the, the air supply uh, to really try to push more air in and, and ventilate better, not ventilate, but try to mix better and dilute better. That was a really, really big practical finding. We were really looking into schools and school environments. So that was one 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 very, very important finding, I think, that that we have very practical. That 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 yes, in summer or or when we, we have a cooling, the air had tendency, buoyancy, the negative buoyancy tend to draw up, it tend to enhance mixing naturally, but in heating mode it, it does not. I had very similar findings in my in my PhD that airflow patterns really matter. And one of the things that I that I measured uh, was that, for example, the displacement ventilation, uh, due to how it works, there are cases, not generally, but there are cases where with the increase of flow rate, you are creating actually a cushion of air and you and suspended exhale potentially virus laden particles are actually trapped in a certain layer, which means that there is more potential for more transmission at, at the higher flow rates. So again, have to be one has to be very careful when just saying just blow more air it's, it really depends also on the system because it's not only about supplying more air it's also how do you supply that more air what are the airflow patterns and that really complicates the whole story of transmission that when we put into equation the airflow patterns matter then we really are in the in the area of, of fluid dynamics we are in the area of potentially computational fluid dynamics and really we have to go and understand our flow patterns that are constantly changing and um, and how environment actually really, really works to much more finer details if you really want to understand the, the, the number of aspects of transmission. So that was kind of the story of, of, of what I what I kind of found out through a number of projects is that that uh, that it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's really coming down to a more complex situation than just supply more air or not. I will also say this, that uh, with Dawn, Dawn Milton and that study that we did on influenza, we did observe, I can't say that they were super spreaders because we have no evidence for that, but there, there are there are people who can spread two orders of magnitude and release two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude, more virus than others, or the average or the median that we measured. We had a sample, I think if I recall correctly, about 200 people and we had a several of those who really were substantially higher. And, you know, that was one thing that I can, this is not a proven theory that I have, but but the suspicion that, that a lot of transmission event involves super spreaders or those who can actually release significantly more viruses than the, than the others. Why that happens, I don't know the answer. I don't know, maybe don't today would know, but at, 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 uh, when we did the study, we just made an observation. So, um, so that's kind of like a you know a few few things that I complicated the transmission case, but um, but it's it's something to really kind of understand that 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 if I can say one message is yes it's all better to to supply more air but you need to understand when you start supplying more air is it really beneficial for the environment that you have so uh, and there are some cases that it may not be. Now, when you say supplying more air, are you talking outdoor air or just more air in general? Well, I mean, supplying outdoor more outdoor air is always beneficial. I'm talking about air in general because the airflow patterns don't just consist of outdoor air. They consist of of any air that is available. So it's, it can be recirculated. So it's yes, the outdoor air is clean and it's better for us that we inhale that. But uh, if the air goes through some good filters, seldomly we talk about recirculating viruses back into the environment. So my view of, of uh, airborne transmission in particular is that it does occur within a space, but not that it's seldomly virus is introduced usually by a person who is in factor who will release in the, in, in the space. But I don't believe that it's really reintroduced to air supply. So from the infection perspective, all air can be considered to be clean air. So uh, not necessarily true, but but it's, a, I think, good enough approximation how you can think about. I've got two follow-ups. One on the, the super spreaders. Uh, did you mm -hmm. notice if, and I'm sure you didn't have real definitive uh, data, but 
would it be younger, like children, uh, adults, male, female, larger, smaller people? Did you see any kind of patterns? No. Um, and I also probably shouldn't use the word super spreader uh, because that's not, a, I did look up if there's a definition of what a super spreader is. So let me retrieve back that word and say there were people who can release two orders of magnitude more virus than the others. Whether they are super spreaders or not, I don't know. That was never really fully defined. That was usually a part of some th uh, theories that people would would suggest. Um, we did not see any patterns. Uh, maybe our sample wasn't uh, large enough to really observe certain pa patterns, but uh, but there were none that we saw. Now, another topic that you and I talked about that I know is of interest to you is, uh, and we were talking about COVID and and mechanical systems, but what about in buildings that are naturally ventilated? What have you found with respect to COVID and the exposures from COVID that are occurring in naturally ventilated buildings? Um, well, I, I didn't in particularly work on, on infection disease in naturally ventilated buildings, but, um, but one thing about naturally ventilated buildings, they can have tremendous air exchange rates and they can really be great but they can also have very low air exchange rates. So, so from that perspective, there is also a second thing, like if you are sick, um, would you open windows in winter? So if, if you are already not feeling well, is there a tendency to close everything or open? Because natural ventilation really demands us to open. So if we use the, the, the paradigm of, of flu, that if you have naturally ventilated buildings and in winter, that's where the transmission are happening and you, and you cl close all the windows, yeah, that, that doesn't sound very promising. That's, that, that, would, that would really uh, be good enough dilution. This is not me knocking down the natural ventilation. It's just really understanding that in the whole one year cycle and COVID doesn't recognize seasons, it, it's always present. It, it, it survives uh, summer conditions. It survives winter conditions. It's, it, it, it's just... Uh, stable in many environments. So on, on that end, we can say, well, okay, if, if I have buildings, definitely there are climates where natural ventilation is very useful, uh, but we also need to look and analyze the, the moments where we, in cold climates, where we cannot really tap into natural ventilation because the air is just too cold and we cannot really ventilate. So I'm not against, and I'm not talking against, but I do think we need to consider how much of natural ventilation is available and a totally different parameter, how much of that natural ventilation we are actually utilizing, because that's another parameter that I did actually study, how frequently people open windows. And I found out that less than one third of available natural ventilation potential is actually utilized. That's my study, but uh, some other people may find something different and it's really based to climate and, and how in tune people are with using natural ventilation. So. There are challenges with just saying, oh, natural ventilation is better, but it's better than nothing for sure. And uh, and there are many times when natural ventilation can do the job and, and be very effective, but also the other side of it when it really will not. I've got a text. I'm not sure. We might need some clarification on this, but it says studies of the actual spread and control of COVID epidemiology are not consistent with your model predictions and recommendations. Have you or other researchers considered this? I'm not sure, Ed, maybe you can clarify, how are they not consistent with the predictions and recommendations? But, Yovan, let me uh, see if you want to comment on that. Uh, well, uh, the question is extremely in general. So if you are talking about the... Uh, there is no perfect model. That's why it's called model. So... Uh, uh, I, the question is not really, really fully defined, so I can give a, a great answer. But of course, there is a epidemiological study you need to understand, describe a particular case when a particular person or a was infected and released viruses and what happened. It's an aftermath of it. So, of course, when we model that and the model, we look into the model, it's always unknown. The source strength is always unknown in infection disease model. So, and that is a key parameter if we want to really measure it accurately or model it accurately. So whatever later on assumptions that we make are still less important than the source strength. And that is a massive assumption that we have to make because we have no databases of what is the span of release of, of viruses that people will do. 
So, so I would say yes, every model is just approximation, and yes, a lot of a lot of epidemiological studies would show a very different patterns that certain models predict. But it's not unexpected or something that we are shocked uh, that that does happen because it's a very one specific case. It's not like that we can sum up many epidemiological studies and start start claiming stuff. That's why the work that we that I did with Don Milton was very fundamental. Unfortunately, I don't know it was very difficult to continue it and, and find funding because we do not possess enough information to properly design the systems and understand what we are actually trying to remove from there when it comes to infection disease transmission. It's a lot of probabilistic work, I'd say. All right, we're 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 at what we call halftime here. I want to thank our sponsors. While we're doing that, I don't know if you can see the chat, but I've got a pretty lengthy question in the chat, and maybe you could comment on that after halftime. We'll be right back with our guest, Jovan Pantelic. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site, your trusted full-service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Our association sponsors are ACGIH, advancing careers of professionals in environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety, interested in defining their science. ACGIH.org. AIHA, healthy workplaces, a healthier world. AIHA.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA's multidisciplinary membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at eia-usa.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, iicrc.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Industry sponsors are Particles Plus, feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, particlesplus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Tramex Meters, developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. TramexMeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, HealthyIndoors.com. All right, we're back. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to look at that text, but um, talking about how the standards offer some good guidance but don't include assumptions, criteria, and processes used in the development also doesn't tailor the recommendations to specific pathogens or scenarios. I think we're talking maybe about the new ASHRAE uh, infectious disease um, standard. I wonder if you have any comment on that. Well, I mean, it's a very difficult. I wasn't part of of writing that new standard, so um, so I I can't really speak what was actually the reasoning in in the committee who did that. But in general, I would say that it is very difficult to base on a on a, on a one particular disease. One thing is that we do not have enough information and data how to really approach one disease. So I think what they were trying to do is sum up a lot of different kinds of knowledge and provide guidance for something that will definitely be an improvement regardless of specific pathogens. Is it enough? That is a big question. And, and if you implement it, whether all different infection pathogens are, are equally affected, not, but to what extent, you know, it's very difficult to say. You know, in, in infection disease transmission, there is that par- parameter uh, that describes how many uh, new infection cases is produced by one infect case in the environment, the called the basic reproductive number, and and that is the key parameter. So can we keep that basic reproductive number uh, below one? That means that this, uh, the transmission is not occurring, and that is very challenging to do. So yes, it, it depends on the pathogen, but it's extremely hard to suggest that and then go down the line of one pathogen. And the one another thing is 
Uh, if you design and you, you really tune in your building just for one pathogen and something else occurs, is it good enough or not? So it's very difficult also on the other side, like which actually pathogen I should design this for. That's why the, the guidelines are probably a little bit vague on, on what kind of pathogens they, they, they would refer to because they are designed for something that's not very specific, but something more general that are assuring that improvement is happening, the exposure is reduced. Now, if, if what you've seen so far doesn't appear, it doesn't appear to you at least that um, recirculated air is the main cause of infection, what types of mitigation procedures do you recommend beyond ventilation and filtration of that recirculated air? Well, of course, there is uh, UVGI. Um, that's a technology that's very well, well known, right? It's not easy really to, to design it in a, in a, in a HVAC system to, to really kill the virus because the exposure to UVGI light that has to inactivate virus is very short. So you, can, you have to use tremendous amount of light. So that's a challenge, how much you know um, that system would cost and then how much energy it would consume. Uh, but um, but uh, other technologies, I don't know exactly. Unfortunately, you know, Again, we, we don't know if ionization ionization works, but to what extent does it have another, another negative byproducts or not? You know, I, I kind of, no. I, I wish that there was a little bit more about research on ionization to understand that better. But unfortunately, unfortunately, that was not extremely research field and we don't have enough knowledge. So, so ionization question mark. What about things like portable air cleaners? Are you a big proponent of those? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they would work, um, but we also put put in a proper context. Air cleaners really work well. Uh, portable air cleaners would really work well if you put them close to yourself. So you actually know that that clean air is actually supplied to you in whatever way and, and you are benefiting from it. So that is what we kind of found with that personalized ventilation, that it's the most efficient way because you, you would supply clean air in the ventilation zone. So if you talk about some smaller, smaller device or even big one, but it's supplying air towards your inhalation zone or as close to your inhalation zone it can supply, that would be something that would truly, that would truly uh, be very effective. Uh, of course, if you want to put a portable filter and clean uh, clean the air for. Everyone else in the room, you really need to size it properly. You really need to look into the numbers. What is the volume of the room? What is the output of that air cleaner? What is the efficiency? And how much clean air delivery it will actually get? So um, so the, those are the parameters that has to be taken into account. But I would say with portable filters, you have this level of control. If you just want to protect yourself and it's your portable filter, to put it closer to you and try to ex inhale as much of that air that that portable filter uh, is uh, supplying to the space as you can. All right. What about um, what, how would you use another of your specialties, the Internet of Things, to assist with making a, a space less of a problem for infection? Okay, so uh, that's a very, very good and interesting question. One thing is really detection of uh, of uh, zones that are not well ventilated, and uh, with the distribution of sensors, you can really see where where the using a proxy of CO two, of course, uh, trying to see which part might be not well ventilated. So, you know, when they establish a lot of co working environments and 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 they re reconfigure the space. Many of the places that were configured did not reconfigure HVAC systems. So they created offices that actually had no air supply. So, of course, if you have a certain office area where you have team working for three, four hours uh, and you have built up to three, four thousand um, uh, ppm of carbon dioxide, this is something you can detect with your sensor and avoid the situations that you know will be a hotspot of transmission. So that is one answer I can give for sure. Uh, another thing is if you implemented certain measures that you can actually um, see what is the e 
effectiveness of these measures. So are they, are they, if you are supplying more air, how that air is distributed? You have to have people because you have to have some carbon dioxide in the room. Uh, maybe in some cases, carbon dioxide is not necessary if you have a lot of outgassing of VOCs and you can have that as a distribution of VOC, but, but you, still need, you, still need to, uh, you still need to really look into carbon dioxide. One thing that I will say that is extremely challenging for IoT sensors that to do particle count and claim that, uh, that they actually can count viruses, that's a very challenging. Maybe some more advanced algorithms can detect that something is of a biological origin, but still the average particle counts in, in, in grade A offices are very low. So, so there are certain things that, that, that's, that can be done mostly. Again, what I think about is, is based on carbon dioxide and distribution of carbon dioxide, whether your measures actually reduce that and whether that carbon dioxide is equally spread to the room. You can also see if you have low carbon dioxide, that is a good proxy of exhale there. Not the perfect one, but the good one, decent enough, you know, for this level of evaluation. And it can tell you some, 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 some understanding. You can provide some understanding of environments. Uh, how good are these, some of these low cost sensors that are available now on the market? Are they good enough to actually help you with managing the building? Oh yeah, yeah. That, that that area really really developed tremendously in the last uh, seven or eight years. You know, those who were used seven or eight years are two or three generations behind us now. So yeah, they they have really substantially improved quality of sensors inside them. And I would say it goes across across the board. All, all sensors have been improved. Of course, you know, we need to understand there are challenges to measurement certain parameters. VOC that's not a well defined. What is exactly VOC? It's a list of 300 chemical components and the sensor can be uh, more sensitive to one versus the other and exactly how it's calibrated. It's calibrated based on one chemical, usually toluene, but am I looking at toluene type of chemicals in that space or not? So generally, you know, we need to understand that measurement of VOC is uh, as whatever device we use is very, unless very specific devices that can really detect what chemicals it's just very hard to say voc is this or that uh, but apart from that and challenges of measuring voc which have been documented in scientific literature on many occasions and there is a very nice review on that as well but other 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 measurements have really really advanced and and are are quite quite decent these days um what about connectivity between the sensors and and when they find some issue and then the building mechanical system or or other components of the building how are we doing on uh the connection between those two um okay so controls, I, I guess i should say controls is what i the word i was looking for the, um well the technical capabilities are there um, I am aware of a few uh, real-world applications of that, uh, but not of many. And it doesn't mean that my knowledge is fully exhaustive on that. I know that in a scientific community, Well Living Lab was the first one who actually published a paper in, in this particular area. So control of IoT, using IoT sensors to control IoT connected devices. So everything is there. It's it's possible to do many of the, or it's not all of the companies provide the abilities to connect devices and sensors. They they, they provide uh, provide uh, IP capabilities to do so. So the air, I think we are going to see uptake on or more cases of, of, of that coming going forward. All right, let's let's switch gears a little bit and go over to wildfires. I know you've studied wildfires and indoor air quality. First, can you tell our listeners a little bit about what type of research you've been involved with with wildfires? Yeah, so I was uh, looking at uh, how different building uh, responds to different types of buildings responds to uh, respond to that episodical um, event. So uh, wildfires is not something we designed for buildings, or at least it was not something that generally buildings were, were designed for. So my, my, my interest in this topic was how buildings would respond to that. Um, and I studied uh, different kinds of buildings. Uh, and uh, 
but the biggest comparison was those who were designed to be natural ventilated versus those who were designed to be mechanical ventilated. So, so that was that was kind of the research that I've done. Wildfires, how how prepared are our buildings to respond to something like that, and and uh, how do we use information uh, to enhance that operation? Because again, that was a time when. Uh, you can mount a lot of outdoor sensors as well that you can all connect them and you can know a lot of, about the air quality around your building, which is very important during the wildfire. You can know also how your building, uh, how your building, and how the indoor air respond and what is the state of your indoor air as comparison to the outdoor air. So there, there's a lot of stuff that these sensors, IoT connected sensors can really tell us in this situation. So that was kind of interest for me to, to find out if they are really effective and to what extent we, we, we can use that. So that's the research they have done on wildfires. Well, how, in your findings, how, how well can buildings respond to wildfires? Do we have a long way to go on that? Um, what I've, what I've, um, some buildings are already good. Um, you know, um, if building ha have a, a good filtration system, um, it can respond fairly well. It doesn't mean that it cleans the air really well. Uh, there are improvements that can be made on, on all levels, in all mechanical, mechanically ventilated buildings, understanding the efficiency of the filters, but also it's important to understand how buildings, how leaky are our buildings and how much infiltration does occur. So, um, so what I've, seen is not that that some mechanical ventilations were able to fully protect people inside and and at all times provide uh provide clean air um or large majority of of, uh, of time provide the clean air some buildings were not able to do so so of course naturally ventilated buildings are designed to allow a lot of a lot of uh, cross flows throughout the building so they are not the they are not very resilient to these type of situations that doesn't mean that we cannot protect ourselves, but it could require some other devices to be present. For example, portable air filters in, in private offices, for example, uh, were very efficient. That's what I saw because the, some people brought that and I had a chance to see that I was operational and how effective those, those were in this situation. So, uh, so what I actually did is not really find an answer. Uh, to the question how good or bad the buildings are, but I did develop a methodology how we can establish the state of our buildings and really understand how they work and what is the methods of placing sensors and using sensors to effectively respond in that situation. So what kind of data you need to effectively respond to this uh, episodical event. If you would connect knowledge of outdoor, uh, outdoor air, of indoor air and, and your system and whether your system should work, should stop, how how to change the ratio of outdoor air to indoor air, recirculated air, and all all those all those parameters that that needs to be in tune. But we have no data, so we either kind of okay, just stop the outdoor air or close the louvers and let's just recirculate because sometimes it's not necessary. Maybe uh, the concentration outdoor is not high enough that our filtration system can filtrate and and provide a clean air. Sometimes. The ratio between the recirculated air and, and outdoor air is uh, is uh, high enough that that uh, the recirculated clean air will dilute all the particles that are not filtered in the outdoor air stream. But also there might be a reverse reverse situation where turning on the mechanical system can actually brought tremendous level of particles inside the building because the filtration system is not not up to the task of of really preventing that. So these type of situations and how how to respond properly that was what I was working on. Now, I've got a text question going back to the um, low-cost sensors and performing much better than seven years ago. Are, are there any specific low-cost sensors you recommend? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to recommend any of them. Uh, I, I, you know, that, that would be very, very dishonest uh, thing for me to do because I have not evaluated all of them. I do have a particular firms that I usually work with and I'm quite happy with them. But but to recommend someone versus someone else, I, I don't really want to want to do that because I, mm -hmm. I don't have exhaustive exhaustive set of information to tell you this is good and this is bad. So but I do have some that I I find 
good and I work with them, but I don't want to name them. Understood. Um, how are they performing better now than seven years ago? In what area? Is it the VOC counter? Is it the particle counting? Is it... Uh... For sure, particle counting has been advanced the most. And uh, the sensors now available are significantly, significantly better than the sensors seven years ago. So that is the area where it had the most, most improvements. Uh, probably VOC is the area that improved the least, but not because the sensors are so good. It's just what is a VOC? There is this whole, whole concept of VOC is a very challenging to, to really understand fully and what exactly am I measuring? Unless we really define a specific VOC, a specific chemical. Uh, carbon dioxide sensors were good and they got more stable now. And temperature and relative humidity, they were good even seven years ago. So depends in, depending on what you really need or want, you can, you can have, there's a number of scientific papers that are saying that, uh, that they have the, the, this low cost sensors have a decent level of accuracy and they can provide you sufficient, with that accuracy, they can provide you a sufficient level of insight. There are other challenges, of course, with IoT sensors that are sometimes related to sensor, but sometimes related to the network. And one big concern is uh, amount of data loss. So how much data I actually am getting and how much data I can utilize uh, in, in my analysis. Do I get below or above the lowest threshold that I designed? So this is kind of a design really standards of, of data quality. So, so there are still some things that we need to improve, but really, generally i think just if, it, if it's well connected and it supplies enough data and it's not really that wi-fi goes on and off and you collect enough data i, I think a, a lot of companies are producing very good products all right john let's go to the roundup <laughs> So what I'd like to do is uh, I think one of the things when we talked the other day that you seemed most passionate about was um, or I felt it was really important was how to communicate IAQ data for non-professionals. And I wonder if you could give our audience some tips on how to communicate their data better for non-professionals that we're working with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a really area that I'm quite passionate about because with the development of IoT and IT sensing, we really can measure substantially more and provide more information about the buildings than ever before. But um, then the big question is, okay, if I have all this information now, uh, who is my end user of that information? And uh, if you want that end user to be a building occupant, there is a big question, okay, building occupant doesn't have to be a professional in the field. So how do we communicate the data? And I think that's a still a big question mark. Is data more confusing for people or, or it's good for people? So I think we are really one of the biggest areas that I would really encourage us to do more research across the board of whoever is the in, in indoor air quality science is really to, to, to enhance our understanding of data communication to the occupants and, and what is actually what they need to know to really produce a, a good actionable items for them. So, so should I open the window? Do, do I communicate that? And what is the best way to communicate that? Or, or uh, should I do this or that? Or, you know, so, something like, like what we see now with a lot of wearables, like that we receive a certain nudges, you should stand up and do some exercises for two minutes or something like that. So, so can we, take some lessons from other fields and really implement in, in, uh, in our field, in indoor air quality, in, in HVAC design and improvement of human environment even in the buildings. Cliff, I want to make sure I give you a chance to jump in here. Do you have any follow-ups or questions? Yeah, I, I do, Joe. Th thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think in terms of communicating, uh, a, a lot of times what happens is the, the data uh, is in the form of a number. And a lot of times it's it's hard to explain what a number is. But, you know, I, I think one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen in a low cost sensor uh, was a sensor that was like our crosswalk lights in the United States. It, it's red, you know, which means don't, don't, you know, it's yellow, which means, you know, it's kind of a warning and it's green, which kind of means it's okay. And I think in terms of communicating with, you know, people in the building, uh, it, 
you know, if you have this green is okay, then they're not going to worry about it. Yellow means, you know, caution, you should think about it. You know, red means uh, there's an issue that would be, uh, you know, that would be beneficial. I guess the second comment I have is it, it just seems that, you know, COVID really took us off, I, I think, uh, in, in one direction in, 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 in regard to infection pre uh, prevention. You know, it, it became all about airborne transmission. And there's a still problem, both probably in Europe and in the United States and in Asia, with old people in nursing homes with C. diff. And that's always, it, it's not airborne. It, it's contact related. And, uh, it, you know, it's kind of an ongoing problem. So it would seem to me that any, you know, recommendations, you know, should also include you know, dealing with uh, high touch surfaces and and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure that this ASHRAE document that was referred earlier really talks about that or it hasn't because I haven't reviewed it. But those are my comments. Thanks. Well, I, I would say that I really agree with that uh, green, yellow, red. Uh, it's very intuitive for us to, to think in those terms because of the traffic lights. Um, and I think that's definitely one way to... To approach it, uh, there is of course some some guidance on how we can approach this from uh, from uh, outdoor air research and communication of outdoor air data. But we need to also understand that it's different when it's outdoor air data versus indoor air data. It's very specific. Uh, I, I think we also need to see if or understand if we can go a step beyond that and recommend certain activities. Whether that type of information go out or don't do this or don't do that in this space or, you know, simply like you're cooking, open the window um, if you can. Of course, whether that's useful or not, or, or that's something that's not useful, because again, we need to assume that that people are not indoor air quality professionals and, and they need something where they can act upon. Can we communicate information in that way? But red, red uh, yellow, and green are definitely definitely something that's a great start and it does work because it's very intuitive for us um on 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 contact contact transmissions and other stuff yeah i mean airborne transmission is just part of the complex of of other pathways of transmission as well uh, the big question for the engineers and that's what i i a little bit covid forced us to yeah, talk about infection transmission, but it was a, a little bit of a taboo in in engineering community because in United States specifically, it invites the question of liability. So, uh, so I think that was a question that many engineers were worried about because, and simply like, am I making hourly rates as a doctor, and should I be liable for infection transmission if I say that I design a system for it? So, so I understand the complexity of the question and. And uh, complexity of infections is this transmission, and and where exactly we stand with liability or not in that case is you know it's it's a very to really now addressing something that you may or may not have expertise on. Yeah, sure, the contact transmission is important, and cleaning the surfaces is is important. But is it really a role of of a mechanical engineer who is designing a system to to uh, also suggest that, or it's someone else's? someone else who has more expertise in understanding full suite of uh, pathways of transmission should recommend certain things. That's, that's a bit of a question. Of course, in hospitals, they have professionals who do that, but outside hospitals, how many times we do a very detailed risk analysis for, for any kind of other building outside hospitals. It's, it's tough when you're in uh, non-healthcare settings, you, you don't have those people there ready to help with infection control like they do at hospitals. Um, before we go, we always like to give you the last word. Is there anything we missed that you'd like to add or any, just any uh, final comments? No, I, uh, I, uh, I really liked that I was invited and thank you for doing that. I would really say one thing, uh, as every single scientist would say, we do need more funds to do research and provide a useful answer. So I would really also encourage through every possible avenue for us scientists in the field and engineers, practicing engineers to interact as much as possible so we can understand what are the problems that we should implement our tools and find the answers to. That's one thing. And I hope also 
uh, that there will be more funding going forward in, in enhancing this knowledge and, and understanding and providing better environment for humans. Yeah, well, we're thank, talking. You, thank you for inviting me. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Well, thank you. We appreciate I uh, want to thank this week's guest, Dr. Pantelic. Very, very, very nice show. Very, very great to have you with us and safe travels out there. I also want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Uh, most importantly, our growing audience and sponsors will be back next Friday at noon. By the way, we've got Nate Adams coming on next week. We're going to talk a little bit more about how mechanical systems and indoor air quality work together, and also uh, a little bit more about um, the um, Inflation Reduction Act and some of the incentives there and what people, you know, the, it looks like they've got that ironed out now. We'll be able to talk a lot more about that. So please come back and join us next Friday at noon for the next live episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.